What's happening? Welcome to Wong Notes Podcast. I'm Corey Wong, your host. Today with us, we've got one of the most legendary bass players of all time. Possibly the most recorded jazz bass player of history. I think maybe even officially that. Anyways, we have Ron Carter on the show today. I first got hip to Ron because of the second Miles Davis quintet. That's the one with Miles, Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, of course, Ron Carter on the bass, and Tony Williams on the drums. Every one of them moved on to be pillars of the jazz community. Ron's also recorded with Quincy Jones, Freddie Hubbard, Chet Baker, Roberta Flagg, Joe Beam, George Benson, Horace... Look, I'm not even going to try to list off his entire discography. Let's just get to the episode. Hit it! This season of the Wong Notes podcast is sponsored by Neural DSP. All Wong Notes listeners get 30% off with the voucher code WONG. Neural DSP creates industry-leading guitar and bass plugins. The range includes signature plugins from some of the best modern guitarists, such as Corey Wong, Pliny, Adam Nolly Getgood, and Tozen Abasi. The archetype Corey Wong gives you everything from crystal clear tones to edge of breakup blues tones, whereas the 14 amp series delivers all the crushing modern metal tones you could possibly need. And that nameless is my favorite Marshall amp ever. There's a plug in here for every type of player and you can get a 14 day free trial for every single one of them without even entering your credit card details. Find me another company doing that. Once you've found the ones you like, you get that 30% off your purchase by entering the code WONG at checkout. Well, Ron, thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Thank you. So a lot of what I talk about in this podcast has to do with guitar stuff, string player stuff, but also so much of it is about artistry and creativity in general. And one thing that I like to talk about is finding your voice as an artist. You've had a career that has spanned decades upon decades working with artists that have been in various stages of finding their voice and discovering their voice. When was that for you? When did you feel like you discovered your voice on the instrument? Uh, I'm not sure how you define my voice. When somebody says they want the Ron Carter thing, is there a thing? Well, I, I think uh, uh, they decide that. I mean, I just play the bass and... and uh, whatever they pick out of what I play that they choose to identify as the Ron Carter thing, you have to ask them what that is. Do you feel like there are certain aspects of music that you see or play in a unique way that other people don't? Well, we all, we all hope that. That's why we are. <laughs> That's why we who we are. I think that it gets to the crux of your question. I think I do have my own sound. And, and uh, with that sound comes... Uh, intonation, decent intonation, uh, reasonable, no choice. But I think one thing that catches people's memory is the sound I bring to the bass. Is the way that you record your bass now different than the way you did it in the 60s or 70s? Well, everything has changed since then. The strings have changed. Uh, the, the maintenance of the instruments have changed. The engineers have changed. They've gotten to know what the bass sounds like on a record as, as, as near as they can make it sound like it sounds like in the room where they're recording. Strings have gotten better. There's so many different kinds of strings. Pickups have, have gotten better. How they record the bass. The rooms are different rooms, different sizes now, different booths. Sometimes they use no booths at all. So all that, all that affects what I do. And I'm kind of at held, held a hostage, so to speak, as to what environment I walk in. And, and my job, if I can split it into one of these sections as my job is to kind of know the room and feel how can I how can I best play this room. Sometimes the engineer will put the microphone, I think, too far away from the bass. And I explain to them, him or her, that when you put the bass so far away, the bass sounds going to decay at a certain distance from my impact, from my hit the note. And the further you move the microphone away, you get more room sound and less sound of the bass. So I, if that's what they insist on, I must play a little bit differently. Mm. If they put the microphone real close to the bass to get the finger sound, which I don't really like, but I accept as part of the price of playing an acoustic instrument, like acoustic guitar, like the class guitar players do with their nails and stuff, I have to play it less, less physically forceful to eliminate some of the 
easily available finger sounds, strings on the bridge, strings on the fingerboard, fingernails striking across the strings. So there are a lot of factors that come into play uh, when I go to a session and, and I try to leave the session with enough of me in the in the tape or in the digital process that when these five people who have a chance to make the disc at your house, the engineer, the producer, the guy who cuts the record, the pressing, all these people affect the sound you hear from my note I play in March at your house, December, two years later. So I try to leave the studio feeling I left enough of my initial imprint, my footprint, so to speak, mm -hmm. on the sound of the bass track that no matter who's fooling with it or fixing it will have enough left of the essence to still sound like me wherever that's played and whenever it's on your equipment at home or in the car. Yeah, because so many times now, between the time you left the session and when you hear it on the radio or on the album, sometimes there's a big difference in the sound. Absolutely. And, and I'm aware of that. And I try not to have that be a, a primary concern when I'm playing. I can't really worry about that, but I'm acutely aware of that. Yeah. Regarding the voice and regarding creativity, you've worked with artists through various seasons of having their voice. What do you feel like as a listener when you hear, like for yourself, you said the listener kind of determines what it is that the Ron Carter thing is. Yes. When you've played with other artists or when you listen to other artists, what do you think is the most powerful contribution to having a voice or a thing on the instrument or in music in general? Uh, you, have, you have to ask those people who hire that kind of entity. Uh, and I, I, I'm trying to answer your question and not continue to be evasive because I don't really have an answer for that. I'm I never, sure. never concerned with that specifically. Of course, I know that, that uh, they may have heard me play on a, 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 a uh, Roberta Flack record where they had a nice open A sound, for example. Or they may have heard me play on a, a Miles record where I made a nice crescendo from F to F to on the E string up to E on the A string. I mean, those kind of details are part of the process when I'm making music, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and to pick out any one of those two items I just mentioned as a reason that they're going to hire me, it doesn't seem reasonable and, and possible. But what, what I try to do, though, uh, uh, understand what the artist is looking for. How can I help him or her best meet their goal? And I understand the pressure that I'm on because they have hired me in hopes that I can make the project meet another level of, uh, of success, whatever that's, that is for them. Uh, so I have to be kind of a mind reader and a, a musical mind reader and, and uh, have to be aware of uh, what whatever their foibles are. I mean, are they the person who needs to have eight or nine starts, false starts before we can start the tune? Or sure. are they that you're the concerned always about the, the departure being specifically correct each time they play it, take number 47? Or, or are they, you know, haven't really got a focus on what they want to sound like, but they want something? Uh, they, 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 can you play a little more orange here or a little more blue? I mean, our language is difficult as it is, and when you don't have the skill, the verbal skill to tell people what you really want and have to use those kind of really general, non-specific, specific terms, it makes it even more complicated to meet their needs yeah. since they really define them verbally. They're all like that, you know, and, and, and uh, the more challenging they are in those aspects, the more I love it because it's my job is to kind of get past those things or in a way of helping me help them, which is why I'm there. I love that your, your attitude about it is when somebody says, play a little more orange or blue, that you're just kind of, okay, let me figure out what they mean by that rather than being frustrated by the fact that they don't know how to communicate that. Well, our, our English, our... Our language, musical language, and certain words have so many connotations. Like, you know, that's a bad dude. Now, that means he's really very good, mm -hmm. very awful. I mean, it depends on how you feel about yeah. it and, <laughs> and how your day is going, you know? So, yeah, we were yeah. in the difficulties of, of nailing a phrase to let the band know exactly what you want and say that only one time, you know? Mm. Studio guys understand the difficulty they put in, that, that someone has put in when they try to explain a feeling that's very difficult to verbalize that we would understand it if they could do that literally. So we're stuck making two or three takes to try to get a, trying to feel them out and try to understand what they hope they want. And the more we play, the more their concept either gets more focused or 
it gets less cloudy because now they hear the choices that had occurred to them. And there we are, take 25 again, you know. When an artist asks you to help execute their vision for an album, what's the most effortless and best way that you can help them achieve that vision? Give them my undivided attention. That's, that's, a, that's a very simple thing to say, but it is something that is a very valuable thing, undivided attention, especially in today's day and age where everybody's got their phones and the entirety of the internet and world's communication at their fingertips. It's sometimes hard to get people's undivided attention or even give it. Well, I don't find it hard to give it. And once I'm at a session and I realized that the concentration is paper thin and everyone's got their cell phones nearby and waiting. I, I, I'll ask those people, can you, can you not do that? I find that very distracting to me. Mm. I know you're on edge. You, I don't know what's most important to you. This phone call you got coming in or this text message you're getting or is your volume turned off or are you concerned about my notes or my kind of time or where the tune is? There's too much stuff for me to contend with. So I prefer the gentleman and lady, if you would not do that until... Five o'clock, the date's over at 4.30. Then you're on your own. Some people like it and some people get offended. And uh, I've kind of been called the bad guy all the time. I've been called the bad, so other things, but I'll accept that for the moment. <laughs> I've been called a bad guy because I trying to uh, they, they think I'm pressing my standard on them. And they're right. I'm pressing my standard on them. Like, give, me your, give me your complete attention so I can make my job worthwhile, worth the reason they called me. To call me because I contribute, and you're in the way of that by the stuff that you're doing. That clearly you don't care. You're not interested in what I'm doing. You got your own scene. Great. At five o'clock, do your thing. But four thirty from now, from now until then, you're mine. You're the music. You're, the music owns you. Not that phone call you're making or the text you're doing. No, I don't. That's just it. Just, it just drains everything from the date, man. Respect for the craft. I like that. That's amazing. I love that. Is there a particular session, an album that you've done throughout your career that the artistic vision was just there from the beginning? The second you guys started recording, it was just the magic was happening? If I answer that, that means that the other ones I don't mention in fail in the category. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. You as an artist, you've put out a lot of records, but you've also worked on a lot of records where there's an artist who's making an album that's branching out into completely new territory. Yes. Their fan base, their history suggests that they might go one way and they take a complete left turn. How do you as part of the band, as a sideman, hired gun, support them both musically and personally through that departure? I, I seldom am involved with them personally because I generally don't know those kind of people if you, as you have described them. Generally, they are working in conjunction with a producer or their manager who has helped them pick the kind of personnel that they think is going to help make this project come to fruition. I, I, most of them, I don't know these people. I don't know the managers. They say, I get a phone call. You have a project to do. Are you available for this date? And yeah, okay. Th that's my only, generally, my only personal contact with them. And when we get to the date, while I'm interested in, in having a relationship with them, I'm not interested in being their friend. You know, I'm interested in helping them tell me what they think they want since it's so far from their normal avenue of music you know and and uh, it's always difficult when the person is stepping outside their comfort zone and they hire the guys who can help them get there but they haven't learned how to help them help him or her that happens sometimes and our job is just kind of be patient and try to deliver the music when they say the downbeat try to give them something that they say well can we try a little more of this kind of sound and a little more and we try to match that indescribably poorly verbalized description of what they think they want and uh, get on that wagon, you know. I, I seldom, again, I don't have go out to dinner with these people, whoever they are. I don't have coffee. I don't, I don't drink. I, and I'm not into the socializing of them to the degree your question implied. In the studio, yes, we're all friends. That's why we're there, basically. And we have a, a common goal, and that's just to make this project, as a person has envisioned it, work out that way. Uh, when it doesn't, there's some issues to be resolved, and sometimes it's not always the music. It's the musicians aren't in the same zone, or the, the music is not well prepared, or the concept is not really thought out. Stuff that happens that's kind of out of the performers, the, the musicians, sad men's control. We try to make the most of it, you know. Yeah, 
Is that the approach that you take to making your solo albums as well? Or do you like to have people around you with a closer personal connection? When, when I put together a, a group to do my music, of course I know who they are because they're my friends and I've worked with them for many years and I know they trust my judgment, they trust my language skills, they trust my intensity, they know that they have one or two takes for this song, we got to get it right, so they bring in their extra patients to go to the store and buy some extra patients at the market because they're going to need it for this date. <laughs> They buy some extra concentration somewhere else because they know that this guy who's at the bass player is going to demand what he demands of himself, of us, them, you know. And, and uh, I try to sit down and before I get this far, have a concept, have the music prepared, have it ready to easily be read, uh, have temples in mind. I prepare the date. I'm not going in there jamming for a concept. I'm walking in there with what I want to do. And I think I hire the people who can best understand my concept after the first take and we get on with the business of music i like that and you said something there where that you've touched on actually a couple times which is you demand the same attention to detail as you give although sometimes that might seem unfair to people i think it's completely fair because it's the same expectation that you have for yourself how can we play without that man we're all in the same boat trying to get the same musical relief for this person who hired us to do this job and i can't imagine my experience doesn't tell me that those guys who don't want to roll the boat the same way as everybody else, their their longevity in this industry is kind of short term, you know. And, and uh, those musicians, those people who become offended when someone in the band is demanding their their attention and their focus, uh, if they get been out of shape, then two things happen: either they will leave the date upset, or they won't call this person who got on their case anymore in life. Those are the chances you take when you take a stand. I'm here to make this music. If you keep fooling around over there and, and, and uh, jamming between the takes and, and stuff people do, man, it's just kind of annoying to me that they haven't gotten enough comfort in their own selves to not have to do those events that make them the focus, even if it's four, eight bars too many, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I look at the span of your career, it seems like the earliest thing that I can find is from 1960. And to give a little bit of context for the listeners... One year that seems to be very special in jazz history is 1959. It seems to be a fork in the jazz road where Miles Davis did Kind of Blue, kind of inventing, for lack of better terms, modal music with static harmony. You have the opposite side of the spectrum, which is John Coltrane with intense harmonic activity on giant steps. And then you go back to the other side of the pendulum and you see Ornette Coleman removing all harmony with The Shape of Jazz to Come. You see exploration from Dave Brubeck doing odd time signatures on Time Out. Mingus did Ah uh, Um. It's an incredible year. There's so many incredible influential albums from there. But I see your career and everything that I've noticed of yours, the earliest thing I could find is from 1960, which is right after that time of all these new avenues being explored. What was the jazz scene like and what was that creative energy like at that time when you were first getting going? Well, I was in, at, at Moose in New York in the fall of uh, late summer of 1959. And I had uh, came to New York to uh, look for work, of course, but I had a scholarship to go into the Manhattan School of Music as a grad student. Mm. So my focus was, can I, you know, can I get a place to stay with my, my family and uh, get to this one more, two more years of uh, college education? That was my focus. Of course, I'm trying to work to support my family, and I had a chance to you know, get, make some jam sessions to get visible, so I'd be in somebody's list to call to need a bass player at the very last minute. There's a new guy in town. Uh, I was aware of the music going on, but never thought in terms of my uh, necessarily having to follow the trends in order to work in New York. That just wasn't my, my point of view. And someone heard me play with Chico Hamilton, and that led to something with Eric Dolphy, who was with Chico at the time, and I met Randy Weston at one of the gigs, so that, that, that was another link and been able to get my name in the musical hopper in New York City. And, and then someone heard me play with Herbie Mann for a while, so I was kind of all over the place, uh, uh, not necessarily focusing on any one of the aspects that was going on in music. Having said that, I did work at a club in New York called The Fast Spot when he was at 3rd Avenue and Cooper Square. And I worked there for eight weeks with Randy Weston, and I had a chance to really hear the music taking place. The, the jazz tech worked there for a while, and Ornette Coleman played there for a while, and 
Can you Durham had a band there for a couple of weeks, and, and uh, it was just a wonderful way to uh, get a master's from 9, 8, 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. You know, I was in school full mm. time with these guys, you know, and uh, those are my introductions to the musical direction that things were taking at that moment. All right, this is some good conversation. I got to remind you, though, have you guys not gone to that Neural DSP website yet? You got to go check it out. Use that 30% off coupon, Wong. That's my last name. And while you're there, check out the Archetype Corey Wong plugin. I guarantee you, if you are looking for good, clean, or edge of breakup tones, this is the plugin for you. There's three different amps, a pedal board, EQ, three different cabs. Come on! You can use it live. You can use it in the studio. There's that 14-day free trial. Check out all the plugins and let me know which one's your favorite. My dad is a huge vinyl collector. When I was growing up, there was tons of records around the house, and he had them organized by label. And he had his classic rock collection, but the jazz collection was organized by Blue Note, ECM, CTI. And there was a visual thing, there was a sonic thing with each of those. When I look at a lot of your catalog that you've played on and stuff that you've recorded of your own albums, it seems like there's different camps. Blue Note Camp, ECM Camp, CTI, and so on. It seemed like you played on a lot of Blue Note records and then went over and did some stuff for CTI. Can you explain a little bit about, did it feel like those were different camps? Did it feel like those were, did it feel like signing to the Chicago Bulls or the Knicks or something? Nope. What was that like? Nope, they're all, they're all labels who had wonderful players who had meant either playing gigs for them on the set or knew of them to work with someone else and they had a project they finally got a date to do with Blue Note or they finally got a date with ECM or they got finally got a date with Curry Taylor's label and they decided since I had played with them at some point that they enjoyed the musical challenge that my presence presented to them now that they're in charge of the music they want to see if I can help them with their project I never thought in terms of musical camps and and uh, mm. The, the Eastern League versus the Western League. It's just all <laughs> guys who want to play the same notes at a good time, and I was happy to be a part of that uh, group of people, as I am today. Was the process different between those labels? I imagine the producers, of course, had a, a say in that, but was there a general process difference? No. Well, Blue Note had their rehearsal two days before the date. Roulette records, you go and make the record cold. Or milestones, you go in and play the record without a rehearsal. They had those kind of differences in, in uh, preparing the music, but they hired the players who they thought fit their, their, the company's plan and process for making a record in one day or two days. You know, they never had a week to make the record. You had one day wow. to leave, come in at nine o'clock, and when you finish, you had a complete disc. One day. Those things were kind of common. They just had different labels, different covers, different people writing the music, different engineers who were their recording favorites. RCA had their own personal recording engineer, a lovely man who made good records. Blue Node and CTI had Rudy Van Gelder sound, a great guy, and, and uh, Columbia had their, had their people. So the engineers were all different, but they all had the same love for the music and did that damn just to make sure that the guys who were recording walked out of there knowing that this engineer got the sound that they wanted to hear a year from now. Hmm. Did that contribute to the output of albums year by year did that feel like it made it easier to make more albums in one year no mm. it's just a chance to play more often with guys and whatever it took to get it done there are more labels of course by then so right now there's what may, maybe blue note and and uh i don't know any other na big label that's recording jazz today so it's a little more difficult to get a company to give you that kind of recording support well you played in the incredible second miles davis quintet and you've even got three compositions on the album ESP. Did he ask you to bring those or did you bring those to him and suggest, hey, I got these tunes, they'd be great for the album? No, we, he always asked everyone to bring songs to the dates. It was never, uh, no one was ever singled out that I know of to be, to be the anointed one whose songs would get recorded on this day. Yeah. We, we all brought music in, and it depends how the time worked out and the kind of tune it was, and I think, and the, the songs of the day, wherever they were, what, what song could fit in this slot, depending on where we are at the, at the time. We were all reading for the first time. We were all reciting the music. We were reciting the concept in terms of what the song presented, and, and uh, those are great examples of a band, I think, that's really into the band 
and their ability to play such music. That's very difficult. The first, the first or second time through and sound like that, they already know this piece. It's a great view of us. Wow. And how did that feel for you to have some, some tunes on a Miles record? Was that like a dream of yours or was that just another day recording and writing? Well, I never realized that until last year when someone called it to my attention. I was happy to get it recorded that day because I saw everyone, Wayne and, and, and Herbie and Tony and Miles, they just put their focus on making this tune work, making my tune work, as I have put the same focus on making their songs work. And that was very important to me to see that, to how equal we were in terms of trying to make any one song that it's our here sound correct and fix it wherever it took without making a big deal of it. Let's change this chord. Let's make this a seven chord. Let's make the ending here. I mean, we were, uh, they were all contributing to my song with the same focus, with the same concentration, with the same honesty that I put in when I'm making my attempt to make their song better than what they gave me before. So it was great to see that and be a part of that kind of vibe. Did you guys recognize at the time that you would all end up being so prolific and legendary <laughs> while you were there? I mean, you have Miles, Herbie, you, Tony Williams, Wayne Shorter. I mean, that's an insane group and who has surpassed all expectations of standing the test of time, not just in the jazz genre, but in music as a whole. Were you guys aware of that magic while you were there? Uh, again, you're putting me on the spot by asking me to answer for them, and I can't. But I will answer for me, and, and I think I had no clue that the music of those times who we were playing and uh, making some terrible choices occasionally uh, would be uh, able to be ranked as to where it is, and 50 years later, guys still trying to figure out what that was. None. We had no view at all. It, not me. I had no sense that it would be what you call legendary, the best planet in, since dirt. Yeah, I never had no concept <laughs> of that, man. Well, music moves us, and especially as musicians, we have a deep connection to music. Sometimes we relate to it in technical terms, eighth notes, a low E, and sometimes we refer to it in conceptual terms, orange or blue, like you're talking about. It forms us, shapes us as individuals when we allow ourselves, I guess, to kind of be vulnerable with it. Has the way that music moves you changed at all in the last 50 years? I've gotten 50 years older. Absolutely it has. And what have those 50 years taught you in your connection with music? Well, some of the things are now uh, not new to me, but they're kind of underlined and, and capitalized. Like uh, as I was playing more and more, I realized that this is one more chance to get better notes from last night. I got to realize that... Uh, as a bass player in the band, there's a lot of responsibility that goes with that, that job. And my job is to continue to do that job as best I can, tune after tune, night after night, year after year. It's taught me to be really aware of my musical partner's sensitivities and sensibilities. And while I, my job is kind of to see where they are, to try to understand where they are and how can I make their way easier, at least for the next 75 minutes of this set. Uh, it's given me a chance to understand what it takes physically to do this night in and night out and what it takes to be committed to kind of being the last man standing. And I think the last thing that's given me a moment to see is how my response to them makes them respond to me. Hmm. Do you think that's purely musical or is there something more emotional and personal and spiritual that goes on for you? All of the above. Which one of those is the guiding one for you? Is it an emotional response? Is it a, a technical mastery thing? Or is it a spiritual thing? I think it's 25% of each of those four items you mentioned. Awesome. Okay, so you do some teaching at Manhattan School of Music. Yes. What are some guiding principles that you always see younger musicians needing to learn from somebody with years of experience? If you could play our conversation with them all, I would settle for that. <laughs> is the way that you teach more about concept or more about actual technical facility on the instrument? Both. You can't have one without the other. Not as a bass player. And as far as regarding what it takes to be a working musician, what are some guiding principles that every musician just needs to know? Again, if you would play this back for those people who are, who are listening to those kind of questions, my answers are already given to you. Well, there you have it. 
all those things that I told you before, I, I'm, I, since I'm sitting down, I sit by those rules. And if I'm standing, I stand by those rules. Those things that I do, I recommend that young players investigate. And if it fits their point of view, fine. If not, try to understand why it doesn't fit your point of view. I like that. Are you aware of the business side of things now? Do you pay attention to that? Or are you more focused just on the music for yourself? I've always been aware of the business side of this. How, have you, how do you feel like the festival scene has changed over the last 30, 40 years? Because festivals are now a huge thing in the jazz world. Well, festivals are a huge thing. They're not a huge thing in the jazz world, because the festivals that call themselves jazz festivals don't just have jazz, if any at all. That's kind of what they call a misnomer, I think. That's the correct word for that. They have many kinds of music, and I'm okay with that. Just don't call it jazz, and you have guys who are not jazz players. I do find it kind of silly sometimes seeing a jazz festival and having Ed Sheeran as one of the headliners. Well, I'm not sure who he is, but I tell you where I am. <laughs> well, that's all right. <laughs> do you know, what, what are some of your favorite festivals that you've played that feel like really represent the jazz scene in a pure and good way? Most of the festivals in Europe, all of them in Japan. I've been to a party of, in, in the States. They're starting to have, or they've had for a while, many, a wide scope of various musics on the uh, jazz festival and the jazz cruises. And I'm not sure that, that those uh, mix and match, those varieties of music that they're under the banner of jazz music are really jazz bands and playing jazz music. That's okay, but don't call it that and wonder why uh, jazz is not... Uh, more available. Sure. So you have, uh, from what I've seen, your first Ron Carter album came out in 1961, and you've had over 20, 30 albums since then. You're continuously making records year after year, which is incredible. What is it that keeps you going in your writing and recording as a recording artist? I have a chance to have someone play what I wrote as I wrote it, and that's a great school to attend. And, and the more chances I get to hear what I think I hear in my head live, the, the less cautious I am about what my ideas can sound like. I think composers who are not in a, in a position to have their songs played right away with people who know how to play the music uh, and who don't need any conjoling or lessons in how to play this part, when they have that kind of environment, it just, it just kind of encourages you to take all kinds of chances that you hear that you haven't had the environment to see if what you hear is a reasonable choice of what you made in terms of this chord or that sound effect or this key or this tempo. And uh, as long as I can keep be presented with this kind of optional environment, workshop, I uh, continue to kind of write what I hear and hope that uh, I'm not too far off when I hear these guys playing. I love that. Well, Ron, it's been such a pleasure to have you. I really appreciate you being with us today. I'm such a fan of your music, the records that you make, but also the records that you've been a part of. It's, uh, it's been a big part of my growth as a musician. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, C-Dub. And, and uh, uh, once this opens up, you have to come by and see me so we can say a real proper hello and share a cup of coffee. All right. I would love that. Next, I'll buy yours and I'll buy my own. I'm okay. I that, that sure like that. <laughs> okay. Thanks, man. Bye. All right. How about that? Ron Carter. I'm not going to lie. Some of those answers really surprised me. I thought that maybe there was a little more personal camaraderie and connection with some of the artists that he was playing with, but it's cool to see everybody's experiences are different in the way that they make albums or the way that they're a part of albums. I've, of course, been a part of a ton of different albums where I don't really know the other artists or anything, and I just come in and play. And other times where it's a band and it's just like the most fun in the world and there's this incredible love for each other on the personal side too. So fun to hear different people's experiences. Ron Carter, sick. Come check us out next week. We got another great episode. Amazing guests this season. I'm really excited. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.